Hello and welcome everybody. Welcome to the World Food Program Innovation Pitch Event on the 30th of June, 2022. My name is Bernard Kovac and it's my great pleasure to welcome you here, the head of the World Food Program's Innovation Accelerator. You're going to witness a really exciting show for you with the stars of the show, which are, of course, the startups and innovation that you're going to see here that have the potential to disrupt hunger. Now, if you're joining us anywhere on this planet, really, you can join the conversation. Um, you can follow us online uh, on WFP Innovation on Twitter, WFP Innovation Accelerator on LinkedIn. Please just you know, leave your comments, post your tweets, Give us a shout out, use the hashtag disrupt hunger. You can post about this, uh, but you also find out, you know, knowledge about our work, about our programs, the impact that we're making through the work that we're doing at the World Food Program through innovations. Now, um, if you don't know the World Food Program in detail, that's fine. World Food Program is saving lives in emergencies and also changing, changing lives for more sustainable and better future, for instance, like through school meals programs, modern child nutrition, or connecting farmers to market. Um, now, World Food Program is reaching about 128 million people in 120 countries and territories right now. And unfortunately, we have to say we are at a critical point in this planet's history, really, with terms of the global food crisis that's coming upon us. Now, we've already been in a world where there's 811 million hungry people on the planet. And that number is probably going to peak this year, like in actually because it's getting worse because of um, uh, conflicts, climate change, COVID, and most recently, we've also seen rising food prices and fuel prices that have been exacerbated by the war that in Ukraine. And this is really one of those moments where, on the one hand, we do need the life-saving work that has, you know, helps people immediately and keeps them alive. And at the same time, we shouldn't forget about changing people's lives and also innovations because investing right now will allow us to really make this big change for people's future. Now, again, we at the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator, we are here with the mission to identify, support and scale those disruptive innovations that can help us end hunger. And we're really thankful for our multi-year donors in particular. So it's the German government, the government of the Netherlands, the US and also Luxembourg. So thank you for all the taxpayers uh, who are actually uh, enabling this work also to actually fund our work that is, I hope, meaningful, and you'll soon find out what those innovations are going to do. Now, we are uh, working as World Food Program actually across uh, four pillars. So we have our World Food Program, Accelerator Program, we work on innovative finance. We also run accelerator programs for other UN organizations, governments, and also big foundations like the Bill Melinda Gates Foundation. And lastly, we work together with others. So we share knowledge, but we also work with others like Google, the World Economic Forum, to actually like leverage and expand our impact through the work that they are doing through the goals that we have to change people's lives. Now, in the World Food Program uh, case, what that means, we're identifying innovations globally. Uh, and that means like in the last seven years, we've actually uh, received almost 8,000 applications across the globe. Then the next stop is typically the innovation bootcamp. You, you see the grand finale of this. So it's the 43rd bootcamp today and the pitch event that's just happening afterwards. Um, and it's the best teams that we typically get out of several hundred applications. The next phase is actually our sprint program where we provide up to $100,000, sometimes more, uh, of equity free funding, so grant funding to startups and nonprofit innovations, uh, hands on support for our team and partners, and connections to our field offices. And the best teams go into what we call scale up enablement phase. And this is complemented through a network of local and regional hubs across the World Food Program. Uh, and of course, as you're seeing, we're running this program not only in person, but also virtual. Now, what has been the impact? By the end of last year, we have positively impacted the lives of 9 million people through the startups and innovations that we've supported. Now, this is something that, you know, if you leave, just look at this, it's like, well, what does this mean? It's like, if you look at the tra trajectory, a startup can be very small. And from the early stages, like from 2015, 2016, we have consistently doubled the number of people reached every single year. And, you know, it's not only about, uh, you know, every, like one person is important, but like, how can we really 
tackling that problem of global hunger, like we do need to get things to scale. And this is where this is really important. And those startups also have raised a total of $180 million of grant funding across the whole portfolio, which is in addition to any equity investments that startups would have had. Now, let's look at one of these examples. And you actually, uh, it's, it's a fun picture. Like what you see on the left is the first pitch of a innovation, internal innovation in this case, which is called h to grow which is using uh, to grow plants without soil, which is particularly right now, it's also one of those aspects where, you know, you can actually harvest vegetables through hydroponics every five to six weeks. So when we're facing a food crisis, a food price crisis, like people can actually grow their own food, they can grow their own vegetables, you can harvest every five to six weeks. Uh, and you can do this as, you know, even without soil, isn't that an exciting innovation? Uh, and part of the scaling pathway to this now is actually to, um, to open source it. So there's the h 2 grow platform that's being used by dozens of different NGOs also, like it's for free, like it's, it's open sourced. Uh, it's active in 21 countries by now um, and used by over 70,000 people. Uh, and uh, most recently we've even expanded this into like an asset-based loan pilot, which we've also used Share the Meal, uh, our fundraising app to actually raise cash to run that first asset-based loan pilot. So it's no longer only just providing those kids for free, but it's also like just providing loans. And then we know actually that you can have a sustainable continuous income using these types of innovation. And what's exciting for me is that all of the pictures that you're seeing today here, they could be the next age to grow or next other innovation that is going to be actually achieving impact at scale. Um, so other examples just to show a few um, is like, maybe to take the one on the left and like there's the uh, plus school means optimizers it's actually one of those little ideas where you think well why has nobody done this before well as a matter of fact like what plus school meals optimizer does like it's a it's a menu app so the person that's designed the school meals locally they can choose like it's an artificial intelligence like an algorithm based uh, tool on on the phone that they can use to design a better school meal and that's optimized based on like where the food comes from, how much it costs, how much uh, like uh, is, is what the nutritious values and to assemble a new menu. And what they've been able to show is that it increases the nutritious value, saves 15% of the cost, and it has a 60 to 70% higher local procurement of the food even. And so there's no be the there's a behavior change involved here, but like the real innovation is that the person that's deciding now has the power of technology in their hands when making that decision. Um, similarly, another example for small farmers is post-harvest losses, which is uh, a really, really bad issue, whereas like 40 to 50% of food in developing countries is oftentimes lost due to post-harvest loss. So like from the deal, it never enters the food cycle. And with that, you can reduce that post-harvest loss to one to 2%. Again, really exciting innovation. Um, and with that, I just wanna say thank you again to our key partners, all our donors, all our supporters, everybody who's supporting us with in-kind service and so on. We're obviously always looking for more, but now it's my great pleasure to hand over uh, and actually, I'm looking forward to all the great pitches of the startups and innovation that we're going to see. So with that, thank you very much. And I'll hand over to my colleague, Regina, over to you. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Bernard, for the invitation. Um, let's go back one slide. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm very much delighted um, to host you through the, the pitch event today. I'm going to host you together with my colleague, Kirtana. Kirtana, she's a new venture consultant at the Accelerator, and she is the one who will be responsible for the Q&A session. So we're going to see the pitches in a minute, and after each of the pitch, you have the opportunity to ask a question. Before we go there, um, let me briefly explain. So we have even received 850 applications for this round, and they were coming from 88 countries. We always go through a quite rigorous review process, and we've selected eight teams, so it's quite competitive. So congratulations already to all the eight teams who have made it today. And there are internal WFP team and, or external startups, so both of them. And today they are coming from El Salvador, from Nigeria, from the US, from the Philippines, from Canada, from South Sudan, and from Rwanda, so quite international. We have conducted a one-week innovation journey 
the boot camp, um, as we, we have heard right now. And the boot camp, it is really about human centered design, it's about lean startup, it's about growth. And you can see now what those teams have achieved in the past and during that one week. So, what is going to, um, to expect you? So we're going to start with the first four pitches. That's the first half. Then we do a virtual fireside chat. And afterwards, we have the second part of the pitches. How does it work? Each pitcher has three minutes. This is very short, sharp, quick fire. So a short presentation about the solution, the problem they want to solve, where they are and what is their ambition, their vision to go. And then we have the opportunity uh, for a Q&A session. So what you can see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A icon. So if you have any question, just write it in. And my colleague, Kirtana, she's going to pick it and then uh, give it back to the team. So two minutes of that. Yeah. And are you ready for the first four pitches? At least I am. So let's get started with the first one. And I'm very happy to welcome Heen Atyemian, who is the logistics officer from South Sudan on the project Sustainable Food for Cooking. Heen, the stage is yours. Hello, Yen Atyemian. I'm a logistics officer for WFP South Sudan. South Sudan is the newest and one of the poorest countries in the world, continues to face subnational climatic shocks and now for the fourth consecutive year unprecedented flooding and i have an issue meet grace a young widow raising six kids in a camp for displaced people in venture to feed her family she like most people in united states is dependent on food assistance to cook meals she collects wood a circle became too expensive after floods cut road access to venture Grace works neck deep who flooded waters for up to eight hours each day, at least three days a week, looking for firewood that is becoming increasingly more difficult to find due to deforestation. This is an arduous task with many risks, including that of gender-based violence prevalent for the women of South Sudan. For this reason, my team and I decided to develop a safe and sustainable fuel market for women to cook their meals. Fortunately, the solution was right before our eyes, introducing the world's worst water weed, the water hyacinth. A fast spreading non native aquatic plant that invaded much of the water bodies in the country. It blocks waterways, suffocates aquatic ecosystem, and when it decomposes, it releases large amounts of harmful methane into the atmosphere. However, this weed can also be a great source of wealth. It can be used to make baskets, hats, furniture. It also contains properties that can even be easily transformed into charcoal briquettes. And with this discovery, WFP South Sudan got to working and developed an easy production process transforming water hyacinth into briquettes using only local means and groups of women and schools on the process. The feedback on both production process and the use of the new product to cook is very positive. Competitive advantage in terms of cost and time compared to firewood is evident. Grace is confident that soon she will be able to send her kids to school with water hyacinth instead of firewood as is now required for attendance. Using water hyacinths to make fuel also helps to open new supply lines, restore food systems, mitigate deforestation, mitigate floods, and lots more. Now, to scale up, we plan to roll out a market-based approach, organizing trained groups into small enterprises, leveraging WFP programs to disseminate know-how to more than 200,000 people and promote better production and demand, and using WFP purchase power to engage the private sector and link them to the small briquette producers to reach critical mass. Help us reach Grace's ultimate goal. She, like many others, wants to be able to provide nutritious meals to her family, ensure kids go to school and have a brighter future. To do this, we need $300,000 and strategic partners to support this growth. We know you want this too. Together, let's make water hyacinth based energy the fuel of choice and provide a better future for South Sudan. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hina. I think this was a great start. Now, I think the idea to transform water hyacinth into bioenergy is just a great idea. I think we are combining climate actions with uh, creating livelihoods and even to increase the personal security of the women. So I think that's just an amazing idea. So um, let's see what my colleague, uh, Kethana, if there's any questions from the audience. Kethana, over to you. 
Thanks, Regina. Uh, yes, Heen, uh, there's a question from Hila. Uh, can this solution be scaled beyond South Sudan? If so, why do you think that's feasible? Over to you. Oh, I mean, it's not, a, it, it exists in the rest of the world. I, I think in Benin, they have some ex experiments. In Kenya, they do it along, uh, along Lake Victoria. In Uganda, they do it as well. But, but South Sudan is an easy win because of the lack of the deforestation of the floods, of the lack of access, of the uh, and uh, and of the of the risk and the, the danger of going and working up to three days actually to go and fetch for some wood uh, in certain areas. So so yes, it it, it should be scaled up and and uh, in other parts of the world, I believe there is in certain contexts there is a lot of uh, there is already some interest from other country offices for us to share what we have uh, developed. Uh, but South Sudan would be the, 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 the easy one to start with. All right, that sounds like a really good gear up for a pilot. Over to you, Regina. Yeah, perfect. No, we are always looking for, let's say, regionally or globally scalable solutions. So I'm really looking forward to that. Thank you very much, Heen. Yeah, and then we have the second picture. And this is Dolapo from the Project Chimony. Dolapo, the stage is yours. Thank you so much, Regina. Um, a pleasure to be here. My name is Dilapo Farare, and I am part of the business development team at Chimani. Now, next slide, please. Imagine that you are currently living in northern Nigeria and a drought has just happened. Um, you are relying on nonprofit organizations like the World Food Program to get you the cash or money that you need for food or water to um, assist you and your family. The current process in place is currently slow. And number two is that because there are a lot of people out of the financial um, system, they're not able to get the help that they need right away. And there is a lack of flexibility. The solution is Chain Money. We are a payment and infrastructure platform that is enabling fast and secure transfers all across the globe. The way it would work and the way we've mapped it out during the accelerator program is with just one click of a button, beneficiaries would be able to receive their cash base transferred, which would be enabled by the USSD system. Basically, what this would allow the beneficiaries to do is choose how they would want to spend their money, whether it's for physical cash, mobile money, or for their wallet and bank accounts. The impact that this has is pretty significant. As you can see up here, it impacts quite a number of the SDG goals that are outlined there. But most importantly, on the beneficiary side, they're able to get the cash that they need within seconds and choose how they would want to spend their money. On the beneficiaries, on the organizational side for the nonprofit, they're also able to expand and reach more beneficiaries because of um, the system that we have in place. Chi Money was really born out of necessity in another nonprofit setting uh, by our founder Uchi. Fast forward 15 countries are now covered um, using our infrastructure program. Google, Microsoft, and other global companies currently use us for employee engagement. Fast forward, what we're open to do is to increase the number of African countries um, that we partner with and have coverage with. We are a very global team, as you can see here, um, with a wide range of expertise from blockchain to social impact and the nonprofit space. Our ask here is to have the $100,000 to pilot with the Nigerian country office as we've mapped out with them already, as well as work with other organizations that are looking to do cash-based transfers, as well as um, businesses that would like to um, support more inclusive payouts. So thank you so much for your time and looking forward to any questions that you may have about this. Yeah, perfect. Thank you very much, Dolapo. Now, this is very interesting. And perhaps just to explain a little bit, WFP in emergency situation is getting in-kind distribution, but also cash. 
And cash-based transfers is increasing during the last years as we really want to build the local economies. So to get a solution which is fast, secure and inclusive and even with multiple locally relevant cash out option is very, very critical. So I mean, we're really looking forward uh, to this kind of cooperation. So Kitana, any question for the Chimoni team? Yes, Dolapo. Uh, considering the regions where this will be deployed, do you need internet connection? If not, what is the alternative that you thought of? Over to you. Awesome. Thank you so much for that question. Um, the infrastructure we're using in terms of like our tech stack will be primarily USSD, um, which does not require um, internet connection. So um, we've mapped this out in the flow um, through the accelerated program. All right, that's awesome. We know that you're super prepared. Over to you, Regina. Okay, perfect. No, great to hear that. Good, then let's move to the next picture. And I'm very happy to welcome Karim Sadik. He is from the GeoChar team, which are uh, of the headquarter unit of WFP. Karim, over to you. Okay, what is happening with uh, Karim? I can't uh, turn on my video. Yes, please turn on your camera. Ah, yes, can can't. you please turn on your camera? Um, I can't turn on someone else's camera. I'm asking you now, Karim. Perhaps it was because you're okay. Karim, okay, no, there perfect. we go. I uh, here we see you ready to go. Fantastic. Thanks so much. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Karim Sadiq. I work for WFB HQ as a senior targeting analyst in the research assessment and monitoring division, <clears throat> as known as RAM. I'm leading GeoTAR project, which is a solution to improve how WFB does targeting, which will impact all of our operations and beneficiaries. Geographic targeting is the most used targeting approach in WFP. It is a way to classify regions to be either assisted or not assisted. We use household surveys to inform this classification. With GeoTAR, we are trying to solve the problem of sometimes having an accurate geographic information, which can make us assist people who don't need it and actually miss out on people who need the assistance. Our solution to such problem is GeoTAR, which is a system that will construct an artificial intelligence powered geospatial vulnerability index and maps by combining key indicators, including those here in the wheel. GeoTAR will be designed with a user-friendly interface and will be used by the field staff, regional offices, and HQ as well. Now, how are we building this system? It all starts with the team. When GeoTAR was endorsed by our division leadership, a cross-functional team was assembled to kick off the project. And we are currently recruiting more specialists to support the pilot's implementation. Speaking of the pilot implementation, three of the country offices that expressed their interest in the system were selected as pilot countries, Colombia, Chad, and Iraq. We are currently in the phase of building long-term partnerships with public and private industry leading firms to secure the needed access to data, technologies, and expertise. One example here is the European Space Agency is considering the pilot already for support with access to data and dedicated technical capacity from their side. Next on the GeoTAR journey is designing the system, piloting it, validating it, and scaling it up as operational solution for WFP globally. In terms of the impact, as a direct result of the higher precision, GeoTAR will improve the effectiveness and fairness of WFP's assistance and will also maximize the efficient use of our financial resources. The pilot alone will directly impact the lives of more than 40 million in the three countries. Before I go, I would like to make a call for action. Our efforts to improve targeting can yield significant return on investment in the fight against hunger. If you think you can contribute with expertise, data, or investment, 
please reach out to us. It will do no harm. Thanks for listening. Over. Yeah, perfect, Karim. Thank you very much. And, and I was mentioning before the mission of WFP is to save lives. So particularly in emergency situation, it's very critical that the right people get the right assistance. So for me to see from an accelerator perspective that new technologies like artificial intelligence really can improve the geospatial vulnerability profiling is just amazing. So now that's great to hear. So audience, if you have any question to the team, not only now, but also for the other pitches please write it now i know there are many questions that you might have write them down then kirtana can pick one of those so kirtana now what is the question for the team yes kareem this one's for you what are the countries that uh, you are trying to focus on and especially for your pilot which are the countries that you've chosen and is there a thought process behind it over to you okay thanks very good question um actually uh, uh, there were few parameters to, to, to select the countries for the pilot. First of all, countries that actually are going through targeting or targeting process, what are part of that uh, uh, process there. So we already have access to the country. We know the operational requirements already part of the, of, of, of designing and implementing the targeting approach. Um, the second uh, parameter is basically where we have a high quality household data to use to triangulate uh, the new methodology against. Uh, that was the second parameter to select. And the, the, the third one uh, would basically to consider different countries in different contexts. So while um, we will be focusing more on, on, on the rural uh, setting in the Chad, uh, in Iraq, it will be uh, more on the urban side. And uh, we'll be focusing more in Chad and Iraq on, on, on more of a refugee uh, response uh, to inform geographic targeting. In Colombia, we'll be focusing more on the side of uh, estimating and uh, um, estimating the probability and the impact of, uh, of uh, flash floods and uh, the impact on uh, uh, the Venezuelan immigrants. So we also try to have some kind of operational uh, contextual diversity in the pilot uh, um, in the pilot phase, which is basically will be critical to inform uh, the plan for scaling up the project later. I hope that uh, answered the question. No, that, did, that definitely did answer not one another question also we just got. And I think this also gives a really clear roadmap uh, just by the filters that you have. Thanks a lot, Kareem. Over back to you, Regina. Yeah, perfect. No, I mean, interesting to you about this diversity. Good, then we're coming to the next team. And this is Rebug to Deepak. And the picture is Anna Paula Bidoya from the country office in Rwanda. Anna Paula, the stage is yours. Hello, my name is Anna Paula from WFP Rwanda country office. And I would like to start by asking you all a question. What if a portion of everything you make was always lost? For smallholder farmers, no loss is a small loss. But what if I tell you that loss could become a gain and that the solution could come from where you all less expected? We are re back to debug and we want to transform waste into a viable product for smallholder farmers. Aflatoxin is a chemical byproduct of post harvest mismanagement. It causes cancer and therefore compromises the economic value of harvest, but also represents a public health issue. In Rwanda, from just from WFP supported cooperatives, Almost 100 metric tons of infected maize are waste identified and wasted each month because of the high values, high values of aflatoxin. This is a devastating loss, especially considering the context of food scarcity. I told you that a solution would come from you all less expected. The solution lies with flies. This is a black soldier fly, an insect endemic to the East Africa region with a unique capacity to metabolize waste, convert it into body mass, and then retrain the nutrients to the soil. By harnessing this unique biological asset, we want to propose insect farming as a new frontier for WFP. While processing the, the food waste, there are two products that can be obtained, high quality organic biofertilizer and, anim, and an insect protein for animal feed. Our business model promotes a circular economy. It starts by linking the WFP supported cooperatives to a facility where the infected maize is identif are identified and separated. Then they are delivered to a designated bioprocessing facility where combined with other waste, it, this becomes the free input for black soil fly larvae farming. Here we obtain the two products, the organic biofertilizer 
and the insect protein for animal feed. Our solution comes at a time where the prices of fertilizer and animal feed are rising. So far, we have private sector partners that have expressed interest in purchasing insect protein for factoring animal feed. However, the keystone of our proposal is to close the gap in food waste and return some value to the smallholder farmers that now see the, their maize as pure, this infected maize as pure waste. This will be by giving them a portion of the biofertilizer in a subsidized price so they can use it for horticulture activities. And we, we are asking for the support to scale up our proposal to connect all the actors and leverage WSP's convening power to create an impact on food waste, rural economies, public health, and overall sustainability of food systems. Thank you so much. Yeah, perfect, Anna Paula. I mean, this is really an, an amazing solution. And I think the formula that you were mentioning is very critical. A loss of crop equals a loss of income. So to have the idea to, to feed the waste to black soldier flies for bioconversion, it's just, just amazing. So I'm really looking forward to this project. Now, Kirtana, what is the question from the audience? Yes, and Apollo, there's a lot of comments on how awesome the idea is. <laughs> we also have a question. Just uh, can you kind of expand on the return of impact of the solution for the smallholder farmers? What kind sure. of impact? Yes, over to you. So the first impact, there are two levels of impact. We're talking about at the, at the economic level, the food waste. And again, as it was mentioned, food waste in this case for this commercial maize purely represents a uh, reduce in their incomes and the possibility of incomes. Right now, almost 90% of the produced maize is rejected by the two biggest buyers, bigger buyers in Rwanda for maize because of the high prevalence of aflatoxin. This is something that is currently happening now. And as WFP, we're also supporting post-harvest management. But at the same time, this maize, this huge portion of maize is a total loss for them since it gets incinerated or even worse, it gets consumed when we have the other layer of public health. So in the both sides, it's, it's not appropriate. But what we want is we take this maize, we take it to a testing facility, and this maize that it's, gets identified then gets returned to them in a subsidized price as an input. So this is a big economic impact for them because right in something that was normally waste with zero economic value for them, now it returns as a high, high quality input that otherwise they will pay in be paying so much money for it and would not be accessible. When, on the other side, we're of course make, having some impact on the waste management, on the cycle of waste, because incinerating waste is also not environmentally sustainable. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Anna Paula. I think this is a classic example for a circular idea. Yeah. Always lovely to hear. <laughs> Over to you, Regina. Yeah, perfect. No, I also, I really think it's a very smart, uh, smart idea. Good, and now we have already the first batch um, and we are coming to the virtual fireside chat. And I'm very happy to welcome my colleague, Sarah Hulbert on stage because she's gonna to welcome two distinguished uh, panelists. Sarah, the stage is yours. Hi, Regina, thank you so much. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone. Uh, very pleased to be here with you and have two special guests with us today who will be discussing how innovation can help overcome the current food crisis. And this is a very timely question um, given the, the situation we are in in 2022 as alluded by Bernard earlier um, in this discussion that there's really unprecedented humanitarian needs with climate shocks, conflict, COVID-19 and spiraling costs of food and fuel driving millions close to starvation, in addition to the rippling effects of the conflict in Ukraine. And in just two years, the number of severely food insecure people has increased by more than 200 million uh, from 135 million people in 53 countries pre-pandemic to over 340 million people in 82 countries today. And we have with us uh, two speakers, Maisa al Gribawi, the country representative of WFP Libya, and Arun Kumar Pendi, head of corporate social responsibility at the John Deere Foundation, to share their insights with us on how innovation can help overcome this crisis. So thank you so much, uh, both of you for joining. And uh, Maisa, we'll start with you. So, you know, as mentioned, the conflict in Ukraine is compounding what is already a year of unprecedented needs. 
and with a large part of North Africa relying on uh, wheat imports from Ukraine, um, Russia, for example. Could you tell us what is the current situation in the region, where you're calling from, and what has changed? And, and what are the main areas that WFP is focusing on um, at present? Maisa, over to you. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Maisa Legrebawi and I'm the country director for Libya. I will tell you quickly about the impact of the COVID-19, the current Ukraine crisis on North Africa, but specifically also on uh, Libya. We have seen since May 2022, uh, unprecedented FAO food prices index, which increased uh, to 28% in global food prices due to the war. Vulnerable households will continue to experience shocks due to this increase in the prices and the pandemic and the current con conflict, plus also the, in the um, internally displaced uh, phenomena we have across the region. Uh, we have been really struggling a lot as well with trying to get funding and we noticed that people coping mechanism is becoming worse and worse on daily basis. Uh, they are selling their items, they are selling their belongings so can, they can actually cope with the highest prices for food, for fuel, etc. So it's becoming a big challenge for all of us these days to try to cater for the people need, uh, not only for the emergency response, but also for uh, making people more resilient to shock. So let me take you from here to a very interesting uh, part, which is something that we did. It's the hy hydroponic actually story that we had. We had some seedling money from the innovation accelerator that helped uh, that aims to help smallholder farmers to adopt to climate related issues. And we started this innovation uh, a year ago. We never thought actually that in time this will grow and will become a huge project uh, and a huge initiative that later on will be labeled as made in Libya. Uh, this initiative uh, WFP actually implementing uh, through it a food for training, food for us program, and to support smallholder farmers, including the hydroponics, which started actually by the hydro hydroponic initiatives. Then the training actually get expanded. We started also looking for more innovative ideas. And we started also targeting more and more host community and people more youth, more women, especially women in the rural area with actually no access to identification. If you have no identification, you don't exist. You cannot have loans, you cannot have access to so many things. And also that initiative helped us a lot actually to grow from a simple and to move from a simple humble project and initiative to a massive now project that later on will support the school meal program that we are now doing with the government of Libya. So imagine a small project, a small initiative that help us to grow so big and help us to give the to, to convince the government to shift their activities and even now policies. We are at the verge of changing the policies, hopefully and have the school meal program as a mandatory program along with the government of Libya. So this is the impact of a small initiative supported by uh, your amazing uh, center. Thank you very much. Over to you, Sarah. Thank you so much, Maisa, for that concrete example of how you're applying innovation to, to build a resilience of, of communities. So thank you so much for that. Um, Arun, I'll hand the floor over to you um, to speak about, you know, in recent years, we've seen tremendous advances in agricultural innovations spearheaded by the private sector. And John Deere in particular is one of the leaders in that space. And what role do you see the private sector playing 
and innovation playing to, to address um, the, the global food crisis that we're witnessing today. Over to you, Arun. Thank you, Sarah. So hello, hello everyone. My name is Arun and I'm privileged and humbled to be here with so many inspiring innovators. I work for a company, John Deere, that has a deep respect for innovators like you. For nearly 200 years, our innovators have developed technologies and solutions that have helped our customers to transform agriculture and other industries so that their lives and the lives around them can live forward. That is why we are so proud to support the World Food Program Innovation Accelerator because we believe in this organization, its people and the innovators like you to develop technologies and solutions to make the world a better place. Now, what the private sectors can offer? The private sector, of course, can offer the financial capital, but given the amount of challenge, financial capital is not so much enough. The other great advantage which private sectors can bring to the table is the social capital in form of employee volunteering, networking, and support, where our innovators can work with innovators like you to mentor and coach. I cannot say enough about how successful the innovation accelerator have been in bringing innovations to life. And it is one of the reason why John Deere Foundation has invested in it. It shows a deep respect or the unique ability to foster innovations, technologies and solutions which have a scale, which have an impact and which are sustainable. The credibility of success is also very important given how the challenges and the global growth which is happening in terms of food insecurity and hunger. As several presenters outlined earlier, because of several reasons such as COVID, conflict and weather extremes. These challenges by a bit of support from John Deere Foundation and the work done by the innovators and support of everyone, we can make difference in the lives of the people. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Arun, for um, those remarks. And we'd like to um, definitely, you know, thank uh, John Deere and the John Deere Foundation for, for all of your support um, over these years. So thank you. Um, I'd love to invite uh, both you and Misa to give um, just some final kind of um, yeah, if you had one kind of uh, tip or word of encouragement to, to give the innovators that we have here today, um, what would you, what advice would you tell them? Maybe Arun, we can start with you. Yeah, so one of the advice, you know, I would say from the private sector, what we look, so, so if you look at many of the beautiful solutions, what we are also talking in our pitch event and also across different places, these are kind of a very good solutions to address some of the challenges and make the world a better place. But I think one of the things we have to look at it, how do we bring scale? I think scale is very important that when we are, especially when these innovations are going to address some of the developmental challenges. So unless we have a scale, you imagine a situation that by 2030, we will have still 660 million people facing hungry. So now if you don't have a scale in your innovations, which are going to address some of these challenges, I think we might not be able to reach our target. So how do you bring a scale? A scale with impact. I think impact is also what is very important when you work in a development space, that with impact, how do you create a scale and then also sustainable. So how, how these solutions are sustainable? Say for an example, if a community is growing a crop in a dry region or like aflatoxin when you are treating certain kind of disease, how do you mix, make those things sustainable? So I think the only piece of advice I, I would give from, and especially from the private sector, that you need to have a scale, you need to have an impact and the solution should be sustainable. Thank you so much for, for that advice. And we look forward to continuing uh, to work with your team who, who's kindly mentoring some of our, um, our uh, sprints on, on these questions of scale and impact. So thank you so much. Uh, Maisa, I'd love to hear from you um, briefly on this as well, as we have a lot of WFP um, entrepreneurs with us here today who are really out there you know, in South Sudan trying new solutions. Uh, what advice would you give them? 
one humble advice don't give up even if now your idea did not fly don't give up you are you have the future in your hands so work hard sell your idea and market them for as many uh, stakeholders as possible and we will succeed we will succeed i saw it in many countries i saw it now in libya i saw it when i, I saw it when i was in iraq your ideas today what i saw until now it's amazing idea i would like to adopt some of them i'm going to contact some of you so don't give up please everything starts with a dream dream big uh, and fly high this is my humble advice over to you thank you sarah thank you Misa and arun um, for your time and um, really great discussion and regina i'll hand the floor back over to you thanks so much yeah, perfect. Thank you very much. Um, very insightful the discussion to see like the private sector perspective who's already strongly supporting uh, scaling innovations in the humanitarian sector and from MISA about senior management who's really, let's say, opening the doors in order to test and, and grow and scale innovations in the fields. And what we would like to do now is to show you one example of a project of a sprint that we have where we really started with an idea. Um, so this was one of the projects that we had in, in a boot camp. Um, if we had a first idea, a first concept, it was in a boot camp. Then we went into the sprint program. They have received some funding from our side, a project manager, um, and we were defining some pilots. And now you can see what they did within two years, an amazing work. So let's have a look at the video. PlugPay is a digital payment solution um, that enables our beneficiaries to receive their assistance through the financial instrument of their choice. So it really incentivizes interoperable payments systems in country in order to provide financial inclusion all the way to the last mile and to empower our beneficiaries to become financially included in a sustainable way. And with that, we actually need the entire financial services ecosystem to rise up. It is really a stakeholder journey together with the central banks with the banking systems, with the mobile network providers, and of course, with our beneficiaries at the heart of the journey. So with that, we will have to put together a system that allows for a globally standardized user journey, however, still respecting the different um, maturity levels and system maturity levels really in country, as they differ massively across the countries in which we operate. Yeah, to me, the key highlights of this sprint have really been um, the interest that the team has received from different country offices, which is a proof that the team is addressing an existing problem. Another key highlight I would say is the approach that the team has um, has embraced along, along the journey. So they've been working with their users since day one. You can see that they're really um, exemplifying what we encourage all our teams to follow. So very human-centered design, but also very lean. So the team started from scratch very quickly, and you can see how they are incorporating all the learnings that they are getting from, from this sprint. What motivates me to drive this project is the need to address some of the risks that we have noticed here at the country office. So we do see risks associated with contracting external financial service providers in a timely manner. And timeliness is key to allow the BFP to respond timely to the needs of our beneficiaries, because in most cases we are responding to crisis. And then even once we do engage those financial service providers, there's the counterparty risk that we then need to manage. And the plug pay is allowing us an opportunity to manage these risks, and that will ultimately allow me to sleep better at night. Okay. Now, this is a nice example, Black Pay. And, and as I was mentioning, like two years ago, we were sitting together, had a first ideation. Then one year later, they were in boot camp and they participated in the sprint program. We defined the first pilot markets in Zambia and Haiti. And now already in March this year, they did the whole caseload of Zambia CBT, as so a cash-based transfer with Black Pay solution. And in May, they had been asked to be deployed in one of our emergencies. So that's really amazing. So the plan for next year is to scale in 10 countries 
with ideally 4 million beneficiaries. So this is really an ideal case on how we would like to work to start from an idea and accompany support the teams until they are scaling. So very nice example and we sure there are more teams today where we have the same story. Second part of the pictures. Um, yeah, let's move to the next one. And I'm very happy to welcome now the next picture. It's Wissal Buyan. He is from Annika Biosciences. Wissal, the stage is yours. Uh, good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Vishal Buyan, and I'm the co-founder and CEO of Annika Biosciences. Sorry, we're coming a little. There you go. At Annika, what we're doing on a high level is using friendly microorganisms to tag products through the supply chain. That means tagging the product itself and not relying just on the packaging. I started the company in 2018 when a pet project turned into a nightmare uh, because of food and food safety and contamination issues, as well as food fraud. So this is 2,000 pounds of a product that was swapped in transit that had to be discarded at the border with, by the FDA. And so this really opened, to, opened my eyes to the complexity of the food supply chain. And what really blew my mind was that it, it required multiple tests and assays, all ranging from $200 to $500 per sample and taking two weeks, just to answer two very simple questions. Where did this product come from and what happened to it along the way? And with that, Annika was born. And what we're doing is essentially using microscopic tags that are totally food safe, that can be adhered to the product itself, and then read out, uh, sorry, uh, product itself, um, which can reduce the time and costs necessary uh, to answer those previous questions by roughly 10 times. And we can read out those tags using a low resource kind of mini lab that we can deploy in the field by one of our Annika field scientists, and in time, potentially even train a WFP agent to, to operate. And our product is very simple. It can be sprayed or misted on the product itself at a warehouse uh, or another key point in the food supply chain. And with the ability to quantify things like how much material is sourced from a small holder or uh, being able to mark maize that's contaminated with aflatoxin, you can mitigate various food safety and food fraud risks. And that can save time and money for WFP and really ensure quality for the hundreds of thousands, if not millions of, of end users. Since 2018, we've raised over 15 million in, in venture capital. Um, we've submitted our, our safety data to the FDA and we're legally able to sell in the United States. Our product is being piloted in the field on multiple crops and commodities in multiple states. Um, and we've grown our company from three to over 20, 20 scientists uh, here in New York City. And our ask from WFP is a field trial. We think being able to prove our technology in sort of a low resource, very rugged environment will help us scale gain visibility, and really potentially provide a, a traceability solution for WFP going forward and past that sprint program. Thank you so much for your consideration and uh, look forward to hearing from, from more people from WFP. Thank you very much. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Vishal. It's, it's a very interesting solution. And I was mentioning before, I think WFP is operating 115 countries and ter territories. And to track, trace and authenticate products, I think through the supply chain is so critical for us. So new ways of traceability um, is, is very important. Yeah, now, Kitana, what is the question for the team? Yes, Vishal, thank you for the presentation. The one burning question in all of us is what are the requirements and limitations uh, to spray your technology on food commodities and what are the protocols that take care of it? Yep, so the application is pretty simple. It's just misting or spray, so that's easy, um, depending on, on sort of where, where the supply chain is and where the, the points that, that of interest. Uh, and then reading it out is actually just a PCR test 
uh, is what we're doing, uh, or a color change test. And so while Onik is sort of handling that process in the beginning, uh, and this is a really quick sort of 20 minute test, um, and we can sample quite in a high throughput way. Um, while we're handling it in the start, we envision that over the next, you know, X amount of, let's say a year, uh, we think we could probably train a WFP agent to do it itself uh, and be able to deploy it in multiple locations. And so Anik is also bringing on board team members in places like Uganda right now and other rural areas uh, to be able to, to handle that, that scaling. All right, that's awesome. This idea always blows my mind. <laughs> Over to you, Regina. Thank you. Yeah, perfect. No, great to hear. No, that would really be an innovative solution. Yeah, perfect. Then we move to the next one. Um, and the next pitch we're going to have is from Ryan Beach, payment instrument tracking from also one of the CBT teams. As Ryan does his very bad connectivity today, we're going to see a video. So let's Hi, turn on the video. Hi, my name is Ryan Beach, and I'm with the Payment Instrument Tracking Team with the World Food Program. In the past, WFP mostly gave in-kind assistance to people in need, which meant physically handing food to people. However, over the past decade, we've transitioned to doing more cash-based transfer because it gives beneficiaries more choice, a greater sense of dignity, and it puts them on a pathway towards financial inclusion while also supporting local markets and economies. But sending digital money to people changed the way that we have to manage our programs, and it requires more attention on making sure that the money actually reaches the right people. It means that we have to be certain about who is in possession of the payment cards because that is where the money is flowing to. As a former program officer in the field, I know how challenging it is to make sure that the money actually reaches the right people. A big part of that is verifying that the bank cards, SIM cards, and scope cards are actually with the people we intended. And oftentimes people will move away and leave their card with someone else. So that's why we developed PIT, which solve these, solves these issues. PIT is an app that people can use in the field to record who we gave cards to. It works online and offline and on any Android device. This means that staff no longer have to record card distributions in Excel sheets, which is good because having numerous Excel sheets becomes difficult to manage, is prone to human error, and it puts beneficiary data at risk. We first introduced the system in Lebanon and the feedback has been positive. Staff have told us that it speeds up their operations, it reduces errors, and it's easy to use. We find that governments and partners also have the same need as WFP for ensuring that money reaches the right people. And so we've seen that PIT also solves the same challenges for their programs. We have a fantastic team behind this product with a diverse set of skills and background. The team spends a lot of time working directly with our field colleagues to understand their requirements, which we use as the basis for packaging a fully cost recovered service that includes clear deliverables, transparent costs, and is tailored to their specific needs. The cost recovery service model ensures the sustainability of the tool and allows us to have the team of experts on hand to support our clients. The more that we can instill confidence in our donors that we know where the money is going, the more likely they are to support more people in need. Our goal is to add smart controls and greater levels of assurance to our programs while also making sure that our processes create a positive experience for the people that we serve. We are able to deliver the impact that we aim for when we manage distributions efficiently and we track the cards that we hand out. We have already proven that this is a real solution to the challenges that are in the field. And so now we are keen to take this to the next level. We need funding to enhance the user design of the application and to explore the use of optical character recognition technology to seamlessly read information when there is nothing to scan and without the need for manual entry. We appreciate any support and thank you for your time today. Okay, perfect. We have spoken already about uh, Hi, cash based transfer. Ryan Beach. Hi, my name is Ryan Beach. <laughs> yeah, let's stop. We have spoken already about cash based transfer before, which is increasing in WFP. And last year, 50% of the money really had been transferred through any bank cards, SIM cards, or scope cards. So, really, to have a digital end to end solution in order to manage that is quite, quite critical. Yeah, but I think Ryan is there in order to answer at least a question. So where, where is he? Hello, yes, I'm here. I don't perfect, know if you can Ryan, nice to see, see me, you. but I think you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you perfectly. Kethana, what is the question for the team? Yes, Ryan, the question basically is, uh, can you help us understand the sustainability plan of BIT 
and probably take us a little bit in deep to that. Over to you. Okay, yeah, we spent a lot of time thinking about that because we didn't just want to build yet another application or something without um, a long-term vision for how we would sustain it, especially noting that we're, we're on what you can call the business side of um, WFP. So we have to ensure a close linkage with our, our tech department um, for, the, for the longer term. But in terms of funding, um, so how WFP works is that um, funding for operations flows to the country offices first. Um, and so the cost recovery model basically um, intends to embed um, costs for operations, which includes operational systems in the country office budgets. Now, the reason that um, this model is also very beneficial is that we form essentially a service agreement um, and, and, and treat the country office as a, as a client. So we agree on the deliverables that we're going to reach. Um, we have a very clear and transparent uh, agreement for what we're going to deliver and when. And then it's signed off by both their country director and our, and our director in CBT. So they know exactly what they're paying for. They get exactly what they're paying for. Um, we put a lot of focus on uh, client satisfaction. Uh, we send them surveys. We you know, hear, try to hear back from them often. So it's a, it's a very different model also of supporting our country offices and especially with technology. Whereas in the old days, we were kind of asking country offices just to contribute a percentage of their country office budgets to some centralized global account. And you know they don't actually know what they're getting and it kind of flows to the major operations, but not always to them. So that's how we plan to sustain it. All right, that's, uh, that's proper information. Thanks, Ryan. I'm sure the colleagues here from country offices will be keen to reach out. Over to you, Regina. Okay, it seems like a clear return on investment of um, the money. Perfect to hear that. Great. And now we're coming to the next uh, picture, which is Ria. She's from the Crops Nutrition Bar team from the Philippines. Ria, the stage is yours. Yes, good day. Greetings from the Philippines. A year ago, our country director visited some farming communities in the Bangsamoro Autonomous Region in Muslim Mindanao or Barm for short. There, she witnessed that crops such as squash, sweet potato, coconut are wasted after their harvest because of lack of market linkages and appropriate food transformation mechanisms. For a country and a region with high levels of poverty, food insecurity, and undernutrition, this is something unacceptable. So how do we solve the problem? Next slide, please. Our answer is through food transformation. So in our model, we will empower the integration of smallholder farmers into nutrition sensitive food chain or value chain, providing them with technical assistance, know-how and market access. So farmers who are mostly women will convert the locally grown crops to a lightweight snack packed with nutrients. So this is what we call the nutrition bar. It has 85% acceptability in terms of taste based on our feasibility study and costs only 33 cents. So if the nutrition bar will be produced at a large scale, this means that the production of local crops will be increased enabling sustainable livelihoods for our smallholder farmers. Next slide. So our vision is backed up by strong support from the seven government agencies that we have identified. We aim to pilot our solution by integrating it into the existing homegrown school feeding program by April 2023, tapping uh, two farmer groups and two to three schools where the Nutribar will be distributed to children. While the long-term plan for us is to help the smallholder farmers to expand the market opportunities by introducing other nutritious products made from locally grown ingredients. Next slide. We are happy to share with you that at this moment, we have planted some seeds, uh, including a proof of concept based on our value chain analysis and feasibility study funded by the South-South and Triangular Cooperation. We also have developed prototypes for the Nutribar and subjected them into acceptability tests. 
We also have secured partnerships for our pilot project. Next, please. So as you can see, we are only four in the team, but we are passionate to represent the smallholder farmers in the region. We came from different fields of expertise. Next. But we are one in enjoining you to help us make our vision into a reality through your generous financial and technical support. Next. I am Rhea Benavides de Leon, the team leader of the Crops Nutrition Bar Project. And together with the smallholder farmers of BARM, let us reap the yield of success. Marami salamat po. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Ria. Very interesting. And you've seen, um, we have a quite diverse portfolio. So we really have like high tech solutions with artificial intelligence, but we also have like product solutions, which are quite simple. And I think this is a very nice case of a nutritious, tasty, affordable bar, which we can um, make of locally crops. So that's amazing. And uh, really something which is more nutrition for, for the school meals. Let's go back to the slides, um, to the overview slide of Ria. Now, Kirtana, any question for Ria? Yes, Ria, thank you for that. Uh, we have a comment saying that this was a very interesting solution, even though low tech. And the question would be, uh, can you help everybody understand what is the level of income increase for the farmers uh, that they will be able to achieve? And speak a little bit about the overall impact that you're trying to create. Over to you. OK. so. For the level of um, increase in the income of the farmers, as per our rough estimator computation, per hectare of crop production per year, the farmers will have around 3,600 US dollars uh, income. And then if they will produce Nutribar, they will have around 8,200 US dollars. So it's around 2.25 times higher from the crops only, and then the, the tree bar production. Wow, that's that's definitely a you know, very remarkable markup. And over to you, Regina, thanks, Rhea. Yeah, that's very impressive. No, perfect. Then let's move to the last but not least picture. And I'm very happy to welcome Carlos. He's from the Kitchen in a Box team from El Salvador. Carlos, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Regina. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Um, I represent Kitchen in a Box from El Salvador. Imagine being a school student that can't concentrate because he or she is thinking about how hungry they are in class. That is the aim of the school feeding and health program in El Salvador, to improve the student's nutritional situation and learning conditions. Of the 5,100 schools covered by this program, a big percentage of them have serious deficits. These deficits are related to spaces for dining, for storing food, for preparing meals, which can cause contamination, malnutrition, and another series of diseases. There is a need for a solution that promotes a healthy and sustainable school environment, a school feeding environment. Kitchen in a Box emerges as an integral solution to this structure of problems. It is low cost, low maintenance, and a durable alternative. It will consider refurbished and modified shipping containers with equipment for food preparation, for consumption, and for safe storage. The impact on the, full, uh, on the, um, on the school environment will be integral and will include, include uh, different features. For example, kitchens will be powered by solar energy, uh, the essential kitchen utensils and appliances will also be included. Training will, uh, will be provided to cooking staff for preparing nutritious food. And rainwater harvesting systems will be also installed for cooking and for personal use. Uh, digital, digital technology will be included uh, to enhance knowledge in different subjects uh, and also to serve as an inventory and food ration control, improving the efficiency of the uh, school feeding program. And uh, last but not least, school gardens will also be included to produce fresh food, and they can also be uh, they they can also serve as an educational tool for students in the in the schools. Um, the Ministry of Education of El Salvador has been a longtime partner of WFP, uh, and also the Innovation Secretariat 
is, is participating and both are fully supporting in participating in defining key elements of the kitchen in a box concept to ensure that we have a, a successful pilot implementation. Uh, on the other side, WFP in El Salvador already implements uh, projects in vulnerable communities that already consider these kind of features. Uh, we install solar panels uh, to provide energy. We install water collection systems. We uh, include, um, we establish uh, communitarian and individual gardens to provide uh, food security. So we have a proven experience in that field. Kitchen in a box uh, will provide a communitarian impact. Uh, the provision of renewable energy and the harvesting of rainwater will benefit the community and local farmers. And they, so they can provide school with fresh produce. The involvement of the community in activities related to the preparation of meals and, and to, to the school meals program will strengthen social cohesion and uh, provide a space for inter intergenerational interaction. So the Kitchen in a Box will serve as a platform for healthy nutrition and education. The idea is to implement the pilot first in five schools in the country to test the concept and gather valuable information. For that, we are looking for your kind cooperation to provide financial resources and technical assistance. After a successful pilot, we're looking to scale up the program to 720 schools nationwide. Consequently, the transfer to the Ministry of Education will be made to, so Kitchen in a Box can be considered as an alternative infrastructure for schools in the whole country. Thank you very much for your attention and, and, and thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos. Um, WFP is one of the biggest providers of school meals, and we know there are many schools who do not have the infrastructure to store food, to prepare, or to consume meals. So it is a great idea to give um, particular shipping containers a second life, so I think that's really smart. Ketana, what does the audience want to know? This is the opportunity to write the last questions. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Regina. There's a lot of very deep questions, Carlos. So maybe let's go uh, with how do you ensure sustainability and long-term maintenance of the technology and tools by the community, considering that, uh, considering the environment you're planning to deploy this in? Over to you. I think, uh, yes. Yeah, thank you. I'm sorry, I was muted. Um, thank you for the great question. It's a very important subject, really, and we're considering uh, different uh, ways to address the, that, that question. Uh, we're thinking of training first, uh, people that work directly with the school meals program, but also the community, and also um, ensuring that, for example, local governments are participating in the program so they can also ensure the sustainability of it. We also, as I mentioned, have the Ministry of Education as a partner. So they also will, will ensure that the uh, school environment is uh, properly adequate to, to ensure that all the services are provided and that the crucial maintenance is given to all appliances and all features that I mentioned in the, in the description. All right, thank you so much, I think. Thank you. Yeah, there's also a clear exit plan, I see. So that's great to hear. Oh, back to you, Regina. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much, Carlos. I think these were marvelous um, eight different pitches. I really love them. And I'm not now sure that the audience is here today and think, well, wow, how can I get involved with those amazing teams? So you can see in the chat, there's a link um, to a Google Forms. So if you have any question or if you want to support strategically with mentorship, financially, any of the teams, please write in the, in the Google Forms and we ensure that we connect you to the team um, and they can go back to you. So you see, let's say, all the different people and try to, to write to whom you would like to be connected. And there's something else that what I would like to ask from you, because we always want to improve and further develop. Um, we are going to share a quick Zoom poll with you just five questions. We would highly appreciate if you can answer those five questions because it helps us in order to further improve, let's say, the pitches on what we do and how we do and how we communicate. So thank you very much if you can just answer those five questions. And then a part of that is a great moment now for me to say 
thank you, because there are many people that I really would like to thank you. The first one, um, thank you very much for the amazing teams and the brilliant pictures. I really appreciated their time, their dedication, and their enthusiasm, what I've seen in the bootcamp, but also in the preparation of the pictures. Secondly, I really would like to thank you all the mentors of the bootcamp. There were many mentors from private sector, academia, from WFP, other UN organizations who supported us and really shared their experience, their learning with the team. And thirdly, last but not least, I would like to thank you to the organization team. There are people in front, but much more people, many more people behind the scenes who helped to run the show. So thank you very much to all of them. I really love your passion and your energy. And now, if you would like to stay connected with us, um, here you find the right address. You can connect us in Twitter and LinkedIn. There's a lot of content on how to disrupt hunger. We share the, the, our portfolio, the sprints, the scale-ups that we have on how we go from our past to scale. So there's a lot of great content. Connect to us um, and yeah, stay tuned also for the few. And now it's a moment to say goodbye. It was nice to have you with us. Thank you very much. And we look forward to see you soon. Bye.